This is the moment that Schwarzschild has been waiting for. This is the stuff that he wanted. And it's really kind of sad to like hear this. Like even despite all the things going on, he was still able to like go and invest in this, in this new theory and find out these cool new things about the universe. Let's talk about Carl Schwarzschild, though. Carl Schwarzschild was born October 9th, 1873, died in uh, the 11th of May in 1916. The, keep that date in mind. Died the 11th of May in 1916, okay? So the first, I would say, he's amongst the first modern cosmologists, okay? He wrote two papers on planetary orbits at the age of 16. So I would say uh, a lot of physicists were doing things a lot younger during that time period. Um, but now, I mean, 16 is young, and he was working on planetary orbits. He, yeah, so so he was always interested in these cosmological topics and the astro astronomy and astrophysics stuff. Um, he received his doctorate from Ludwig Maximilian University uh, in 1896, studying Poincaré's theories. So again, Poincaré did a lot of stuff uh, that was uh, I I don't know who translated it to, to uh, astronomy and astrophysics, but definitely very uh, relevant nowadays. Um, he became the professor of the prestigious institute at Gotten, Gottingen, Gottingen, influenced by Hilbert and Minkowski while he was there. He worked with Hilbert and Minkowski. That should start to say something. Yeah, he really liked astrology. <laughs> he really liked cosmetology. <laughs> he would love to talk about his signs while doing his makeup. Yeah, so he was the, uh, I have to edit all this stuff out of my YouTube. Come on, guys. <laughs> quantum, co quantum cosmetology the best. You don't ever know where you're putting on the eyeliner. It's it's awful. Um, Hilbert space is a lonely space. Depends on which Hilbert space. Some of them are very, very busy. Uh, but Hilbert and, he, so he worked with Hilbert and Minkowski and that was hugely beneficial to him. I mean, think about it. What was Hilbert and Minkowski known for? And, and, and like they, you know, yeah, Hilbert space, Minkowski metric. Like these are things that are gonna be very, very relevant uh, in, uh, in, Carl, in Schwarzschild's, wow, his soon future. Um, so he was, the, he was the director of the Gotten, Gottingen Observatory in 1901. So he was always looking up at 19, uh, always looking up at the stars when he was uh, a professor and very interested in that type of, of, of physics, right? Here's the weird part. In 1914, he joined the German army at the age of 40, I think it was. At the age of 40, we can figure that out. Uh, yeah, age of 40. Lieutenant of the artillery on the Russian front. I found that to be unusual at 40 that he felt compelled. After all of these things are going for him, he joins the German army at, at the age of 40 and begins, uh, and he immediately goes through the ranks and becomes a lieutenant of the artillery on the Russian front, okay? And uh, so this is World War I. The Russian front uh, for both world wars for the Germans was very rough. But I think they actually were doing okay. Um, they were especially doing okay in 1914, in 1915, um, as far as like his, his, you know, his, him being concerned. Uh, 1915. This is when things start to get uh, unusual. Uh, he developed a rare auto, autoimmune disease known as pemphigus. Pem pemphigus, I think, something like that. Um, Pemphigus has, uh, it's very, very painful. It's lesions, blisters, and usually during that time you would die by infection. So yeah, very, very serious risk of infection uh, with this uh, Pemphigus, right? Especially now he's on the Russian front line. Uh, okay, so despite this, he still wrote to Einstein with the first solution to general relativity. The 22nd December. 1915. When was relativity, general relativity, uh, released in via Prussian lectures? Does anyone remember when it was released in Prussian lectures? <clears throat> I'll give you guys a second to answer. He wrote his first solution to general relativity, now named after him for the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, I don't want to say when. <clears throat> was it November 25th? I thought it was. I thought it was earlier than that. <laughs> if that's the case then it's even more astounding. I knew it was in the, I thought it was mid to end, maybe middle is when he started. It was like a 10 day lecture series or something like that, or 10 days, five lectures. Maybe it was a lot longer than that too. Ow. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, yes, Welcome so general relative. So in February, or excuse me, in December 22nd, 1915, <clears throat> Carl Schwarzschild comes up with the first solution to Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, a month after it was, it was really released. It was really like Einstein figured out general relativity in the last chance he had. This is what Schwarzschild was like waiting for. All of his life looking up at the stars, looking up at the sky, going through all of these cool things, writing planetary orbits, you know, director of the, of the observatory, all this stuff. And then he sees the paper that talks about the perihelion of Mercury, something that I'm sure he was very familiar with and describes it very well and he goes right to town on this and comes up with the Schwarzschild metric. So old man reads old books. Let's read something from Carl Schwarzschild. We're going to read the letter that he sent to Einstein on December 22nd, 1915. Let's read. Esteemed Mr. Einstein. Again, this is December 22nd, 1915 from Carl Schwarzschild to Albert Einstein. In order to become First, in your gravitation theory, I have been occupying myself more closely with the problem you posed in the paper on Mercury's perihelion and solved to first order approximation. Initially, one factor made me very confused. I found for the coefficients g mu nu, I'll call it g mu nu, I think he has g, uh, g, I don't know what that is, n mu? I don't know. In, uh, but I'll just say g mu nu because that's how we refer to it nowadays. Um, in first order approximation, in addition to their solution, also the following second one, and he has an equation there. Uh, I will post this, actually. That's a good idea. Let me post it here so you can follow along. I'm not going to be reading out the equations, but you can see the equations if you'd like to. Uh, but an equation that basically describes the metric that he's working on, right? According to this the metric, there would be a second alpha in addition to yours, and the problem would be physically ambiguous. Thereupon, I took my chances and made an attempt at a complete solution. This is the, this is the stuff that we're talking about. Not an overly lengthy calculation yielded the following result. There is only one line element that satisfies your condition. Uh, and then he gives some conditions that Einstein has. Uh, aside from the field and determined equations and, at, and is singular at the origin and only at the origin. Okay. So there's a singularity. Now, if you also follow me on YouTube, I did some shorts recently. I might do some more now that I'm more settled into my garage and have some more time uh, where I talk about these different things things, uh, you know, and one of the things I did was I showed how these singularities show up in the short child metric. Very cool, uh, very interesting. And what their role is, especially with black holes. Let's see. Uh, <clears throat> the equations for the orbit remains exactly the one obtained by you in first order approximation, except under x, not 1 over r, but 1 over uh, big R, which are just different radii, understanding 1 to be, I think, the Schwarzschild metric, it looks like, or the Schwarzschild radius, excuse me, uh, which is different by the order of 10 to the negative 12, thus practically absolutely irrelevant. Okay. Now, the problem of the two arbitrary constants, alpha and beta, which the first order approximation had yielded, is, is solved in that beta must have. Uh, specific value of the order alpha to the four. Now this is again just talking about the parameters of this metric that he's written. Uh, most of it is just details. We're trying to get to the, some of the other stuff that's more uh, about himself, right? So uh, thus the uniqueness of your problem is also the best of order. It is wonderful thing that the, that the explanation for the mercury anomaly emerges so convincingly from some, such an abstract idea. As you see, the war is kindly disposed toward me, allowing me, despite fierce gunfire at decidedly terrestrial distance, to take this walk into your land of ideas. So that's what he ends. He, he ends with, as you see, the war is kindly disposed towards me, allowing me, despite fierce gunfire, at a decidedly terrestrial distance to take this walk into your land of ideas. How wild, how wild is that, right? That he's on the front lines, of, of fighting, he's working on, you know, trajectories and artillery constantly under gunfire and the cold of winter. Then he's got an autoimmune disease that's giving him blisters and lesions that could likely end his life. Okay, more to follow on that. And he still solves this. I don't know the exact, uh, I don't know exactly where it is. I'm not going to find it now. But the way that it goes, this way the story goes, I have the alerts back up now. The way the story goes is he, uh, Einstein writes back, completely surprised that Schwarzschild is able 
to come up with this solution so easily, so quickly. And it like completely baffled Einstein that someone came up with it so quickly. They end up sharing a couple more correspondence, correspondences, 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 um, before ultimately, um, and unfortunately, Karl Schwarzschild does die from an infection uh, that he develops from the uh, Pemphigus in uh, 11th of May, 1916. So not even, what's that? Not even five, not even six months, not even a half a year later, unfortunately, he passes away. Um, so he solves this in December of 1915. They write back and forth for a while in the winter and then uh, he passes away uh, in the middle of the spring. Um, so it's, it's a wild thing to think that this is the legacy that he left, right? That he has this, like this, all of, all of his history up to 40, up to the age of 40. <laughs> I still don't know why he joined the, I still don't know why he joined the army, but you know, it is what it is. Um, where he's just constantly doing everything about looking at the stars, his astronomer, planetary orbits, you know, <clears throat> Uh, studies Poincaré's theories, and then has a prof you know a, a, a director of the observatory, prestigious uh, institute as a professor, studied with Hilbert and Minkowski, and then, um, and then you know, and then it ultimately Einstein puts out this paper, and it's instantly like this is this is the moment that Schwarzschild has been waiting for. This is the stuff that he wanted. And it's really kind of sad to like hear this, like even despite all the things going on, he was still able to like go and invest in this, in this new theory and find out these cool new things about the universe. And ultimately, again, like we said, this was the thing that led to what we now consider black holes. Right? There's these two singularities that happen in the Schwarzschild metric. I have a YouTube short on this. It's very, very fast. It's only a minute long, so it's like a, you know, a nice little dose of physics. Where like you have these two singularities that show up really easily in the equation, and one singularity is at you know the origin is at the singularity, and the other singularity, the other zero in the equation, is at the uh, the uh, Schwarzschild radius, the event horizon of the black hole. Very, very fascinating and interesting stuff. Um, how long did it take him to teach himself GR? <laughs> well, could have been more than a couple days. <laughs> no, I'm imagine that he's. I imagine that he watched. You know, he watched Einstein's progression through. You know, the developing of developing uh, of GR. You know, like he probably watched like a hawk. He's probably really excited to like see what general relativity was about to understand it. You know. And like then when he comes up with his you know final theories about general relativity, it's like let's go, let's do it, let's let's solve it. Um, very fascinating, right? So that's that. That's the little tidbit of it, of history and fun. Uh, Carl Schwarzschild, what a story! What a weird, what a weird and like epic story. Like you you oh man, I can't even imagine being under all of that stress, all that stuff, and then just be like general relativity, nobody understands it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna solve it. I'm just gonna solve it right off the bat. And like, even Einstein only did like numerical values for the perihelion of Mercury, like, right? Like that was his thing. So ultimately what, what Schwarzschild did was come up with a, 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 a metric that describes spherical bodies in space. And then he applied that metric to Einstein's Mercury thing and found another value. Let's see, like, uh, it was like the same, it was like, you know, it was maybe like a slightly more accurate or something like that, I don't know that. I didn't really follow that part too well, because um, I wasn't versed in the things that Einstein said earlier uh, either, so. What do you think? I taught myself GR in a weekend, but I forgot it all on Tuesday. <laughs> nice.